So thank you very much for the introduction. Um, yes, very recently a PhD graduate, very new to the scholarly communication uh, society. I remember I served on a panel on repositories and knew nothing about them, uh, which I think tells you a little bit uh, coming from the researcher perspective. So I want to start talking today uh, about this tweet. And so I think this tweet is interesting. Does anyone know who this is or what this refers to? So this is uh, by the author of a very infamous nature paper around arsenic life. Um, and the tweet somewhat makes sense. She's defending uh, you know, discussions happening only within quote unquote scientific venues, largely because she's being attacked uh, in very public venues such as Twitter, Facebook, blogs, um, and probably a few others. And so I, I think this is interesting because I agree with points of it, but I also disagree with a, a lot of it. Um, and I also think it's telling to how scientific communication occurs. So the fact that we think public should be separate from that, or as this is kind of a normal thought, uh, you know, shows largely how um, traditional publishing occurs. So I will be talking about gray literature and social media as open review to further muddy the waters of open peer review. Um, I think most people, when they think of open peer review, think of the traditional peer review system, and then they're made public. So I'm looking at things in quite a different perspective, um, and we're approaching things at the winnower in quite a different perspective. And this is to really empower gray literature, and even social media, if you will, uh, as new forms of uh, open peer review. So this is maybe what you think of when you think of social media. It's what I think of, cute cat pictures. Um, Social media and social networks are highly effective at sharing cat pictures. Uh, it's probably a bigger industry than scholarly publishing. But it's not just that. So there's a lot of other things going on that I hope to share with you uh, beyond this, this funny or cute cat. Great literature for this audience. Most of you know this, but I think, you know, as a PhD research in biology, I would not have known what great literature was, and I would have thought something along the lines of this. Uh, and I'm not going to say anything else about that slide. Uh, and so going forward, I'd like to define these so we're all kind of on the same level. So social media are applications that enable users to create and share content uh, or to participate in social networking. Sounds kind of like what scholarly publishing should be. You'd like to enable users to create and share content uh, within a community of their peers. Gray literature is uh, some overlap with social media, so a report or manuscript circulated or published by unconventional routes. Uh, and we at the Winnower are largely focused on publishing great literature uh, in that we give them a DOI and permanent archival for a blog. Recently, I've started to reach out to listservs to even curate uh, emails, um, Reddit AMAs, really everything that's being written out there that most traditional publishers ignore. We are saying, uh, okay, this should be count not only for the scholar, but also for the scholarly record. So how big are these two entities and how are they used? Um, most of you probably know, a lot of you are on Twitter right now, um, maybe criticizing this talk, which I encourage you to do. Um, but how were they used, I think it's somewhat unfamiliar because a lot of us do use it to share pictures of our dogs or cats. I know I certainly do. Um, so I'll highlight a few of these, not all of these, but some of these I think will be new for this community and I think to show that there is value beyond the sharing of the cat pictures, I'd like to show some of the use cases. So these are metrics, um, from uh, Reddit, from the channel science uh, in Reddit. So Reddit can be a good and a bad place. It's basically a place where you share links. People can upvote or downvote them. Um, recently they released, you know, they're trying to be more transparent as well as journals are, a report on their metrics because people were saying they were being too restrictive uh, actually. And so this is from one channel alone and there's multiple academic channels on Reddit. But as you can see, uh, it's quite big. There's a lot of people there, a lot of people commenting, 100,000 to 125,000 comments per month. Um, this are comments on traditional publications, um, as well as uh, new events that they're hosting themselves, and then a lot of page views. So this is driving traffic to traditional journals, as well as fostering discussion around traditional journals. And so here's what it looks like, and you can see these are links to publications that appear in traditional journals, as well as uh, an AMA, which is an Ask Me Anything. Uh, PLOS has formalized this where every Wednesday they have one of their uh, authors will basically um, be available for a Q&A with the community. Uh, and we are actually now formatting these as white papers or as PDFs. 
uh, assigning them a DOI and archiving them. And so this is great. I think it's one of the biggest intersections uh, between the public, uh, but also amongst researchers. And you can see sometimes they've introduced flair, so you may not know who the person is. They may have a funny screen name, but there's actual you know, verification that they're a PhD in whatever. Twitter, this is probably very appropriate since a lot of you are tweeting as I speak. Um, I had a hard time finding uh, actual statistics on academics using Twitter. I still think it's very small. I didn't use Twitter as a PhD student until I had the Winor, and now I use it every day, multiple times a day. Um, most people in my lab didn't, and I would argue you know, a lot of academics are still not using Twitter. But Twitter is big. Uh, there's 320 million monthly active users, and this um, graphic over here is showing how academics are using Twitter. So this is from uh, a survey of over 3,000 uh, researchers, and I'll just quickly point to it because it's uh, somewhat hard to read, I think. But Twitter is used largely to follow discussions, to share content, um, and along with that sharing content, you can discover recommended papers uh, and discover peers as well. And I've actually discovered a lot of people that I've met through Twitter that I've never met in person are actually in the audience, um, and so I hope to actually meet you guys uh, face to face. So how else is it used? So here's someone shares a link, and you can see this is subtweeted, uh, which is really just kind of you know a funny word for review. These are peer reviews. These are scientists or scholars looking at this, um, and this, the study is saying social media exposure does not have a significant effect on download and citations. Well, this may be true in that case because it's a very tiny sample of all paywall journals. So sharing things on social media that has a paywall is not you know, going to go very far. And in fact, there's an entirely new website also started by a student to get around this problem, which uh, I guess I'm not supposed to name. Facebook. Facebook is somewhat not, or, or is not used as heavily uh, as these other ones for actually engaging with academics. I use this largely to connect with my family, which is across the United States, um, and to be friends with people from high school that I, I don't know anymore. But that, I think, is changing in certain groups. So if you look at astrophysics, um, and I just quickly stole this um, from a, a blog, there's a lot of groups going on with very vigorous discussion uh, around astrophysics. They're actually closed, so you need to ask uh, permission. Some of these groups are restricted to only astrophysicists. Um, this is for, true of science journalists and other things as well. Uh, there's nothing in my own field that I've found uh, to be you know, so worthwhile, but that doesn't mean that things are not happening out there um, that are they're great, and I think this is one of them. Uh, there's social network um, sites that are specifically geared towards academics, so academia.edu and ResearchGate. These are growing uh, quite a bit, or they've grown quite a bit. Um, I believe I'm on both of them. This is largely in case you're contacted, so I think the engagement on these are somewhat low, but I think they're trying to change that. So they're introducing discussion mechanisms around these, uh, you know, endorsements um, and different things there. And this is usually uh, commenting on the, the papers uh, that have been published through the traditional route. PubPeer, uh, I don't know if you guys have heard of this. This is bills itself as kind of the online journal cub. And the way this works is you can take any DUI or URL, put it in there, it'll pull the metadata, uh, from Crossref, I believe, and you can comment anonymously or with your name on any piece of work. Um, this has been used to take down a lot of fraud in science. Uh, there was a big legal case around this where they took down a paper and a researcher lost his job or his new job offering, and they got sued. Uh, they won that, uh, and they're continuing on. And I think what is interesting here, I show the numbers, um, not just in terms of comments per month, uh, for PubPeer, but also for PubMed Central. So PubMed also has a commenting function on uh, PubMed papers, but it requires you to use your name. You also have to have a paper on PubMed to be able to comment on there, and the numbers are quite low. And so this points to the fact, or and I think you know, opens up the discussion that we're going to have later, is how do we get people to peer review in a way that's not just saying, this is fraud, I want to take this down, uh, and to be proud of what they're saying, because people ultimately want the content out there. Um, that's why they're taking the time to do this. They care about the scientific record, but why do they not want to put their name next to it, I think is an interesting question, and I'm not sure you know, just a DUI will help, as I can you know, tell you from our own experience. 
Um, journal clubs, so this is a little bit of self-promotion. Uh, we publish, uh, or we're trying to encourage groups to publish their journal clubs. So journal clubs happen <coughs> differently uh, around the world in lab to lab basis. Uh, from my own experience, every week we would discuss one paper that was relevant to our group's research. It would be led by a graduate student um, and they would go figure by figure uh, through the paper saying, okay, here's what we agree with it, here's what we disagree with it. And I think this is really a tremendous way to learn how to review papers. The first time I ever sat in these, I read the paper and said, oh, this is great, it's in this big journal, it's, it's amazing. And then my boss, who was leading the journal club that one time, pointed out all these significant flaws and how to look at the papers and the weaknesses. Um, and it's really where you kind of develop a critical eye and I think become a, a good peer reviewer. Um, along with, you know, actually reviewing articles itself. And so we're trying to encourage groups to publish their peer review, or uh, their journal clubs um, by blurring the line a little bit between a publication uh, and a blog. So we give a, a DOI and archival via Portico and it looks nice as an altmetric widget, um, so on and so forth. And this, this quote I take um, from a paper uh, recently, I forget the name of the journal, but there's a journal that basically published a paper where they found their peer review process uh, failed. So someone, you know, pushed a fraudulent paper through and it was very nice that they went back and looked at where they had failed to address these concerns. So I appreciated that transparency. And I highlight here um, initially where these flaws were found. And this was found during journal club discussion uh, as part of the training uh, for pharmacology residents. Blogs, um, Again, the numbers on these are somewhat hard to come by, but there's thousands of them. I think Altmetric has uh, at least 8,000 on their list. Uh, some are very active, some have a lot more views um, than the actual original research. I highlight research blogging, which basically are blogs, anything that refers to a, a traditional publication would be included in this or aggregated in this. And these are not necessarily used as a form of review where it's this is wrong, this is right, but maybe highlighting it for a, a lay audience, uh, which I also think uh, is important. Um, and this, uh, again, is a bit of self-promotion, but I, I think it shows that blogs are actually being used in different instances. So th this uh, researcher had published a, one of his blogs with us, and now it's been cited, I think, 18 times, which is more than a lot of his traditional publications. Uh, to submit with us is very easy for a blog. You copy and paste a URL, and that's it, and then you can uh, leave it open for review or you can close it uh, immediately. It's, it's led by authors. Um, and then I kind of conclude this survey of all these uh, different social media platforms by s taking a quote out of this recent paper that after 14 months of informal post-publication discussion, the hypothesis was refuted. And no, this refers to that original tweet. So I believe that a lot of this informal post-publication discussion Maybe some of like what we're having now is important and so we should not ignore it, um, but we should actually figure out how to make sure it's done in a better way that's preserved um, and that also you know, can be validated and tested and um, uh, it's not perfect either. I think this also asks the question, if we're noticing a lot of these errors uh, in post-publication peer review, well, how good is classical pre-publication peer review? Um, I feel like I may have to duck now after the last few slides because this is where I get a little uh, tacky. So uh, the, the, the name, the winner, and the idea of the winner came from reading The Trouble with Medical Journals, which is by Richard Smith, former editor-in-chief of BMJ. And these studies, I think, are very, you know, uh, you know eye-opening to me. And so to test peer review, classical peer review, which is really the big difference between a blog uh, and a scholarly uh, literature is peer review, you can insert major artificial errors into a paper and send it out for review. Uh, if you have a journal, of course, not everyone can do this. And so this is what they did uh, at BMJ. They put in nine major artificial errors and on average only two were detected. So this is months, sometimes years of time uh, with results that may not be so perfect or is it what we would expect. This has been repeated at JAMA, again with similar uh, findings at the Annals of Emergency Medicine uh, again, and I think this is somewhat scary because it's all in medical journals. Um, and then uh, another study looking not just at can peer review detect errors, but the bias of peer review uh, sought to test this back in 82. And what they did here was basically take 
papers that were already published in a journal, changed the name of uh, the authors on that, and the institutes from somewhere, the, the names were like Balula Ardas, and they would change them from Harvard to Tri-Valley Institute and send it back to the journal that had already published it. And the majority of these cases uh, were rejected. So these were journals that were rejecting work that they had already published, not because they wouldn't come out and say because of the names, uh, but because of fundamental flaws. Uh, they got caught halfway through this, um, and actually there's a typo down there. One went through a uh, tenure battle, so his tenure was revoked. Uh, and they, I think, moved to, to Yale after this. And so we, have, we published the backstory on this, which is how I found that out. Um, and then last but not least, if you look at uh, the agreement between reviewers as to whether papers should be accepted, uh, revised or rejected, it's close to chance. Um, and so you would think if there's an objective, or, uh, how objective the peer review would work would reflect some agreement amongst reviewers, uh, but it does not. Um, and so that doesn't mean that I think peer review is bad. I don't. I actually think peer review is great. I wish it was happen out in the open. So we talk about open access, and this refers to the primary publication, but I think you know, we're ignoring stuff that is very valuable, which is the experts critically engaging in discussion around the work itself. Um, and so this is uh, a survey that we did on the Winor. Uh, it's quite small, so there's only around 100 responses, but I think it, it gives a good reflection of how people uh, feel about peer review as it is now, how they feel about open peer review, um, and then a few other things. And so I would put myself as that I benefit from being peer reviewed, um, and then I think others benefit from peer reviews as well. Uh, I think what needs to kind of change in this is that we need to start to make them open. Uh, this would be good for others to learn how to peer review, to verify the peer reviewers, to see who peer reviewed it, um, and of course, I think it should happen in a post-publication manner because we talk about even when peer review works, if you find a big flaw and reject it, well, there's a lot of journals now, we'll, we'll publish it, and you'll never see that um, negative uh, peer review. And so I think it's very interesting that you publish these discussions uh, and leave them open to see. I think that's, you know, maybe not the best thing for selling your journal, but for the community it is the best thing. And the Winor has the same policy where we will publish things that are wrong. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of wrong things on the Winor. We facilitate uh, those reviews to say, okay, this is published, but this is also wrong. And I think the onus is on people to be right. People don't want to publish uh, wrong research, um, but making reviews in an easier way uh, um, will discourage that. And so would, would making peer reviews open be, oh, I think this title, oh, would it change the content? Um, no, not significantly. Uh, I think it probably wouldn't. I think the biggest thing that would change would be the tone. So right now, peer review, if you've ever seen that cartoon, is basically like, you know, going through uh, a fight. You know, it is really uh, contentious. There's a lot of, I saw this one YouTube video that is down the impact factor ladder, and the way they portray peer review is they put a blindfold on the person and then they're boxing that person. And so I think making reviews open uh, makes it harder for you to be an a-hole. Um, and I think that constructive criticism is a good thing. And this will also transition to ways where we can leave open post-publication peer reviews that are not just, this is fraud, uh, but I think this is a, a good paper. Uh, would it require a lot of work? I don't think it necessarily would. So there's some great organizations working on kind of making peer reviews open that have already existed, uh, or that are already out there, I should say. Um, and I don't think it would take too much work, because really the content is not going to change. It's going to be the tone. Um, or maybe the content will change a little bit where you have to really back up your claim saying that you disagree with this or not just ask for another experiment because it's easy and you have that power to do so. Um, and so I, I'm going to follow with a few quotes, uh, basically from the, the survey that we did talking about open peer review. This is from an editor in a medical journal. And basically, they actually studied this, um, and they looked at it didn't change the quality of it, but it actually changed the tone, which was slightly more constructive. And this quote follows that as well. Um, they take more care and effort to review carefully and thoughtfully. Um, and then if it had been published, the remarks that are exceptionally rude and are stupid would probably have been avoided by the reviewers. And I think this is true. No one wants to be super aggressive and mean uh, in the community, or if they do, there's a small minority of them, and I think you know, uh, light is a great kind of sanitizer. 
Uh, so how do we get people to start to make their reviews publicly available? Some journals restrict this. So if you want to make your review you, uh, uh, open and it's been uh, you know, published in a uh, journal that's not open peer review, well this is somewhat tricky because the authors didn't know it was going to be uh, open later, the reviewers didn't know, and, and so it can be difficult. And so what would make people to leave their reviews open if they were given the chance? So you mentioned that most don't put their names on it. Uh, I think the biggest is if they're valued in terms of their career. So if the, uh, I always call it privilege, privilege. promotion and tenure uh, committees started to look at these as opposed to just, and they do in a sense, they say you, you put where you review, um, but you're not largely saying how many reviews you did and what the quality of those reviews were. Um, and then if more people started to do it. So it's always hard to start, you know, kind of a movement of people. Uh, it takes a few small, brave souls. So what do I recommend in terms of the peer review language? Uh, major revisions, and this is largely uh, not just to say we need to do away with everything, because I agree that there's a lot of great, um, you know, infrastructure there. I think it just needs to be kind of shifted around. Um, you know, experts reviewing papers is a good thing, but behind closed doors that only two people can read, uh, I would argue is not a good thing. Um, and so the winner was my attempt at that. I launched the winner very naively, said, okay, I'm frustrated with scholarly publishing. I used to publish on my own a lot. I have publications in big name journals. Uh, cost a lot of money. It was slow. It would be reviewed by people that I knew personally. Um, and so I said, okay, well, I'll just fix this. Uh, I quickly realized how naive that was, and you know we've shifted to where we are now from trying to publish more original type research to this gray literature. Um, and when we first launched, I considered us, uh, ourselves somewhat a mix between scientific publishing and Reddit, so somewhat a mix between uh, social media and science publishing. I think that is somewhere where we are, and I include this because this is cool. This is the founder of the Reddit, and I, uh, and I, I thought that was interesting until I saw this tweet, which goes back to uh, peer review. Uh, on uh, social media, and this was, says that really if you're a mix between traditional publishing and scientific, uh, uh, and Reddit, well that would cost 3,000 pounds to post a photo of a cat eating bacon a year later. And so there's aspects that we don't want to take from that, uh, and vice versa. There's aspects from social media that we don't want to take uh, to traditional peer review. Um, although maybe someone would do this. Uh, so here's the winner. Um, we publish yeah, all the things that basically the big publishers ignore. Uh, and we're also trying to include younger generations. So undergrads can publish in undergrad journals, which to me are not so attractive, basically because they're called undergrad journals. Um, they also have very low vis visibility. So this is a big initiative that we're trying to push, is to get the next generation publishing earlier in kind of a you know, light publishing scenario so that when they go to uh, publish in these more um, you know, official type journals, they, they have some experience in this. And so they have some experience publishing. They also have some experience um, with open peer review. Uh, so DOIs and archival for Reddit AMAs, listservs, uh, even um, conference summaries, so talks, people have presented their talks. There's now great citizen science um, projects published on the Winor. So if anyone's heard of Foldscope, these are um, cardboard box microscopes that people can go around and take pretty high quality pictures of whatever they want to look at. Um, well, the, some of those are starting to appear on the Winor, and this is out of a, a group on Stanford. Uh, as Tony mentioned, we've grown quite a bit. Uh, we have over 4,500 authors and now over 1,100 publications, which I think is pretty good uh, for being two years old, starting from Josh Nicholson as a graduate student. So we didn't have a Nobel Prize to consult us. That may have made things some easier, somewhat easier. Uh, but I think I, I understand the, the perspective of the researcher very well, which I think has helped. Uh, and we're also playing the same game that traditional publishers are playing. So if you think about it, a DOI and archival for all these new forms of media really makes us kind of the prestigious venue for this. And so I think this has led uh, to people to publish their blogs with us because we're not necessarily easier to write a blog. There's WordPress and Blogger, but to get these traditional type tools, uh, you have to go through us, or you can get it a few other ways as well. Um, that's not to take all the credit. We're not alone. So there's a lot of great uh, groups experimenting in this. Um, Science Open, I believe, is here. Open Air for funding us and funding new initiatives. I think this is the critical thing that is missing. Science publishers have a lot of money to experiment with and they're not doing it. We have almost no money to, uh, and we're entirely experimenting. 
Um, and so I wish they would give us some and we could do more experimenting. Uh, F1000 research, uh, which is largely very similar to the WinOR, but purely focused on biomedical research, um, arranges uh, reviews, whereas ours are all, all author driven. And I think that's important because it's hard to get people to review unless you have someone really bugging you. Uh, but there's still lots to be done, and so we are experimenting daily with new initiatives, journal clubs, even listservs now we're, we're thinking about curating and publishing. Um, we need to figure out ways to incentivize people to participate in these, so I think the discussion that we'll have after this will be good for this. Um, and then can we improve upon some things that we already do? So can we automate uh, a better way to identify appropriate reviewers? So I think, I mean, maybe I could be wrong here, but a lot of journal editors use some of these open source tools or some of them have uh, proprietary methods of finding reviewers. Can these be improved? Um, and can we do it in a sense where we have basically a pool of validated reviewers, a way to identify them, not just as one person looking, but maybe aided by uh, um, computers, so AI a, a bit, uh, and then the invitation of reviewers. Um, and so these are more kind of pie in the eye, ideas, or pie in the sky ideas going forward, but I think we shouldn't be scared to try, you know, risky things. Um, and then what else can we do to make peer review more robust? So we're looking at gray literature and post-publication peer review, but I'm sure there's other things that we have not considered, um, and I think we should start to think in ways that are more creative than just making this open. That, uh, you know, is the first step. Well, what can we do beyond that? Can we include more in the peer review process? Maybe graduate students, maybe postdocs. I served on a panel where uh, one PI and one editor said postdocs shouldn't be allowed to review, which I mean, kind of made me somewhat furious because we had received a PhD and back then postdocs, you know, postdocs are a relatively recent phenomena. They used to go on and start their own lab, uh, but because there's so many of us and because funding is so tight, now there's this kind of limbo period where you're, you're still treated uh, a bit like a child, despite being, you know, 30 plus years old. Uh, and with that, I'll say thanks. Uh, thanks for listening to my rant. Hopefully you found some of it informative, and I'd love to talk to you guys uh, at the break. Um, you can reach me at the respective locations, and I'm happy to take questions. <laughs>